Hi class, welcome to lesson two of unit seven. Uh, this will be the uh, lesson in which I really get into the early battles of the Civil War. So this is where the action begins. Uh, and I don't talk obviously about every single battle that took place during the war, but I will talk about the major ones, the ones that set the tone for the war, the ones that are major turning points in the war. Uh, and the most important battle to know from this particular lecture is going to be the Battle of Antietam because it basically leads to the Emancipation Proclamation. So I'll talk about the establishment of some of the major generals during this uh, war uh, in this lecture. I'll talk about some of the generals showing that they're not quite as good as previously thought. Think McClellan. We'll talk about that later. Uh, one thing to keep in mind though throughout this entire lecture is that Lincoln has a uh, very fine line he has to walk. He has to keep the northern states in favor of the war enough to finish it out. And whenever he issues the Emancipation Proclamation, one of the major reasons he does so was because it would keep the northern citizens on board of the war uh, again long enough to try to see this thing through and preserve the Union. More on that a little bit later on. Okay, first off, Let's talk about the two areas of fighting that are going to be uh, involved in this lecture. Uh, most of the Civil War is going to be fought in two main theaters, and a theater is basically an area in which many battles are taking place. And uh, the Civil War is mostly fought in either the Eastern Theater or the Western Theater. There is a little bit of fighting that happens out in the Far West, but I won't be discussing that uh, at all. It's not going to be uh, the most impactful uh, fighting that happens. Most of the impactful fighting happens in the Eastern Theater or in the Western Theater, uh, but not the Far West. Uh, so the Eastern Theater will be the area basically in and around the two capitals, uh, in and around Washington, or not in D.C., uh, but around D.C. It'll be around Richmond, largely in Virginia, but not entirely in Virginia. So when you think of the Eastern Theater, think of the area near the two capitals of the United States and of the Confederacy. And this is going to be fighting that largely involves Robert E. Lee and uh, McClellan at first as his opponent, but later on Ulysses Grant. Uh, Grant's not going to be in the Eastern Theater until, until later on. Uh, but this is where Robert E. Lee is going to make a name for himself. This is where Stonewall Jackson will make a name for himself for the Confederate Army. More on that later. The other theater is basically everything else we're going to talk about, and that will be the Western Theater. Uh, everything west of the uh, Virginia area, everything west of the Washington, D.C., Richmond area, all the way to the Mississippi River. So you see that mapped out there. Uh, and the Western Theater is going to involve, initially, it's going to be much more involved with trying to take over the Mississippi River. Uh, once that part of the Anaconda Plan has been fulfilled, you will see uh, the... Uh, Union basically start to go through the heart of the South, which I'm showing you here. And in here, this is where they're going to start ripping up a bunch of railroads uh, now that they've got the Mississippi River under control. More on that in a uh, later lecture. Okay, so let's talk about the first battle. Now, if you look at the notes, every time that I talk about a battle, it has the same format of a chart. You'll see the main information of the chart, or, or the, the, the main name and the main result, uh, and the location at the upper left. We'll do that first. Then we'll do the details of the battle itself, and I'll talk about the action of the battle, and then I'll talk about why it was significant at the bottom of the chart. I'm going to go ahead and say now that for each of these charts that you see, highlight the box about the, that uh, lists the name and the location and the result, and highlight especially the significance. The details are interesting, but it's the significance of the battles that are most important to note. So again, highlight the, the basically the first box and the third box, so the box that starts with the name of the battle, and then the box that talks about the significance. Okay, so the first actual official battle of the Civil War is going to be the Battle of Bull Run, or to be more accurate, the first Battle of Bull Run. I don't believe I'll be talking about the second Battle of Bull Run uh, in this class, uh, for this class, but there was a second one in pretty much the same location. We'll only worry about the first one. And the interesting thing that happens in this battle, it does take place in Virginia, it takes place very close to Washington, D.C., and it is not only going to be a Confederate victory, but it's going to be quite a surprise that it is a Confederate victory. 
And the reason that this will be a significant uh, battle is that it sets the tone for the war. So what happens in this battle? Well, it takes place only about 20 miles away from Washington, D.C. You can see Washington, D.C. right here, and you can see the battlefield right here. Sometimes this battle is referred to as the Battle of uh, Manassas because it took place near a town called Manassas. Uh, but we'll call it Bull Run. A lot of these, these uh, battles had various names depending on which side was naming the battle. Okay, so in Bull Run, uh, at this battle, you're going to, again, have it take place very close to Washington, D.C. In fact, it's going to be so close to Washington, D.C. that civilians are going to come out to watch the battle. This is almost like tailgating before a football game or going to watch a football game. Uh, so they're, they're going to this battle. These civilians are very confident. These are Union civilians, largely. And they are very confident that the Union Army is going to uh, rout the Confederate Army. Uh, they are very confident that it's going to be practically no battle whatsoever. They think that the, the rebels are basically going to flee as soon as they see the Union Army. Uh, they do not expect it to be bloody or very bloody. And they definitely don't expect the Confederacy uh, to win. But that is what's going to happen. So initially, again, the northern citizens are going to be very confident, if not overconfident. And they think that this battle might end up being the only battle or one of the only battles of the war. And that once the Confederacy sees how strong the Union is, they'll give up. And again, they were definitely wrong in this assumption. There were people that thought that this war might last three months at most. Uh, and it's going to go on for four years. So again, this battle is going to definitely set the tone for the war overall. Now, when the battle first begins, the Union is going to basically do what the Northern citizens expected. It is going to be winning the battle very easily at first. A lot of Confederates are going to begin to retreat. And uh, this can be compared to a sporting event, let's say a football game or a basketball game, where during the first half of the game, one team is dominating and beating the other team uh, very well. But then after halftime, the team that was losing makes a comeback and ends up winning uh, the game. And that's basically what happens in this uh, battle. And oftentimes in a game, a sports game like that, you usually have a player that gets real hot and starts playing really, really well, and then that kind of inspires the whole team and helps lead to a second half comeback. Well, in this battle, the person that helps lead the second half comeback is going to be a man named Thomas Jackson. So I've told you about uh, Stonewall Jackson before. I told you about how he was very religious and also very fearless uh, and was not afraid to die. And so as some Confederates were retreating, uh, Thomas Jackson, the general at the time, is going to stand tall. He is going to not surrender, and neither are his men. And uh, that's what earns him his nickname, because as he's doing this, as he's holding his ground, despite the fact that other people aren't for the Confederacy, uh, one man's going to come up and say, look, there's General Jackson standing like a stone wall. And there the, uh, Jackson gets his nickname. And then I think literally within a minute after giving him that nickname, that man that had given him the name uh, is shot and killed in this battle. This is one of the battlefields that I've actually been to, so I've learned little extra stories like that one. Uh, so Jackson is going to basically halt the Union advance or help halt the Union advance or slow it enough to where uh, he stalls and eventually reinforcements are going to come in for the Confederacy. Uh, there were some woods behind the battlefield and some of these reinforcements are going to come out of the woods. Uh, and all of a sudden the South or the Confederacy finds himself winning and all of a sudden the Union soldiers and the Northern citizens are shocked to see that the Confederacy is winning this battle. And so in the end, the Union troops are going to retreat. They are going to retreat in very embarrassing fashion and you have this very awkward embarrassing scene where you see Union soldiers and Union citizens almost tripping over each other as they're trying to run away back to Washington DC. Uh, there's even a story of one of these Union uh, soldiers that as he's running, he keeps turning around to face the battlefield so that if he does get shot, he won't be shot in the back and, and it won't look like he was a coward. Uh, but in the end, the Union is going to be defeated. They are going to retreat and they are going to stumble along with the civilians in very embarrassing fashion back 
uh, into Washington, D.C., those that made it. Many of them did not because they were killed on the battlefield in very bloody fashion with the new uh, uh, weapon technology that I talked about in the last lecture. So the significance of this battle. Uh, one thing is that whenever this battle takes place, it's the first time whenever these new weapons that I talked about before, uh, like the rifled uh, bullet, are going to be used. Uh, and so this war, or excuse me, this battle is going to uh, be much bloodier than any of the civilians had expected, definitely bloodier than a lot of the soldiers had expected. And again, a lot of these soldiers fought by lining up uh, in an old school fashion, and that just led to more of them getting mowed down by these newer weapons. So one of the significances of this battle is that it shows that the war will be deadlier than expected and bloodier than expected. I told you before that this is the deadliest war in American history, deadlier than all other wars combined. The other major significance of this battle, and this is again talking, uh, speaking to the theme of setting the tone, is that it shows that the Confederates can fight a lot better than the Union thought. And in fact, they will not be easily defeated, nor will they be quickly defeated, and this surprise Confederate victory is going to show that this war will not be over anytime soon. Uh, there was a northern, uh, I think, congressman that had actually speculated that the battle or the war would be so quickly over that he could wipe up all the blood that would be spilt with a single pocket handkerchief, and he is going to uh, obviously be wrong. Uh, there's more blood spilt in this war, again, than in any other war we've been in. Uh, so this war is going to be a lot longer than expected, a lot harder than expected for the Union to win, although they will win in the end. But again, this battle is kind of a, a microcosm of how the war is going to go, except that ultimately the Union does win, but it will be a much longer, bloodier uh, struggle than expected. Okay, on to the next battle, and uh, this one, the reason I'm going to talk about this one is because it's going to establish who becomes the best general for the Union Army, and that will be Ulysses Grant. Okay, so this will be the Battle of Shiloh. This will take place in southern Tennessee, and... Uh, it will be in the Western Theater, and in this case, the Union is going to win this battle, and it's largely because of the leadership of Ulysses Grant. And I will tell you that his right-hand man, uh, William Sherman, will be involved in this battle as well. And eventually, Grant and Sherman are going to part ways and, and do different jobs towards the end of the war, but I'll get to that later on. Uh, so this is going to be basically the same script of, as you saw in the last battle, except you're going to flip who wins and who loses. So this will be another one where one side's winning in the first half, but the other side makes a comeback in the second half once they get reinforcements. So in this battle, uh, leading up to this battle, uh, what Ulysses Grant is doing is he's working his way, as you can see, uh, towards the Mississippi River. He's trying to get towards the Mississippi River, but before he gets to the Mississippi River, he decides he wants to go to Corinth, which you can see here in the map. And what is he wanting to do in Corinth? Well, he knows that it's a hub of many uh, southern railroads, and remember, the South didn't have that many so, uh, railroads, so if he could take out the railroads in Corinth, he could really cut off any kind of railroad transportation in the South. And the Confederacy was not dumb. They knew that this was a vulnerable spot. So what they did is they decided to launch an ambush on Ulysses Grant. So again, Grant and Sherman are going to be breaking railroads, cutting up railroads, uh, melting the, or excuse me, using fire to soften the railroads to the point that they could twist the railroads and make them unusable. Uh, and again, that's what they're doing on their way to the Mississippi River. And remember, why are they trying to take out the Mississippi River? Because that would divide the Confederacy and it would execute a major part of the Anaconda Plan. But on the way, like I said earlier, the Confederates are going to ambush the Union troops. And they are going to suffer terrible losses. Uh, this is going to be a very bloody battle. There's going to be one uh, part of the battle uh, in which... Uh, there's going to be, I believe, 12 cannons that are going to be fired upon uh, troops at point-blank range and basically blow up a whole group of people. I believe that was known as the Hornet's Nest. Uh, again, this was a very intense battle in the woods of southern Tennessee. And again, remember that 
The Union this time is going to suffer terrible losses. But the thing to remember about Ulysses Grant is that even if he takes heavy losses, and I've said this before, he's willing to take heavy losses if it gets him the win. And that's what happens. This will be a two-day battle. On the first day of the battle, the Union is going to pretty much lose, but they are going to hold off. They're not going to retreat. Uh, when nighttime comes, the two sides stop fighting, and they're going to wait till the next day and resume the fighting. Uh, and so on the second day of fighting, Grant, and there you see him pictured, is going to get some help. This fight is happening along a river, and on that river come some Union reinforcements to help out. So the second half comeback will be led largely by Ulysses Grant. And in the end, these Union reinforcements are going to help secure a victory for uh, Grant and for the Union. Now there's going to be a problem for Grant. And that is the fact that even though he won the battle, many Union citizens, northern citizens, when they find out about this battle, are upset because they see how many people were killed or injured during this battle. And a lot of northern newspapers are going to criticize him for the losses that he had, even though he had won. This is why sometimes people called him the butcher. Uh, because he was willing to allow a lot of his men to die in order to, to win a, a, a battle. And, and historically, usually if a battle was fought and more than 10% of a side was lost, then you would see that side surrender or retreat. The Civil War is different. In the Civil War, you're going to have battles where sometimes up to half of the troops on one side of the battle get killed. Casualties are much higher uh, in this war than in previous uh, wars. Uh, anyway, so the North doesn't like Grant because his methods lead to a lot of deaths. Uh, he was known to have a drinking problem, and a lot of the uh, northern citizens and northern newspapers tried to bring up his alcohol problem uh, as a way to kind of criticize him and maybe get him removed from power. However, there is one person that likes Grant, and that person is Abraham Lincoln. He's famously going to say, I can't spare this man because he fights. And he says that kind of as a slap in the face to another Union general, McClellan, who doesn't fight all the time when he should. And I'll talk more about McClellan's uh, reluctancy to fight a little bit later on. Another thing that Lincoln says in response to the accusations uh, of Grant having too much of a drinking problem, Lincoln says, find a barrel of whatever he is drinking and send a barrel to all of my other Union generals. Because again, uh, Lincoln didn't care so much about Grant's personal problems so long as he was getting the wins, and he was getting the wins. Uh, so Lincoln will be in Grant's corner even if a lot of the northern citizens aren't. Now, once the war's over, Grant has become a war hero, and the United States is going to elect him as uh, president of the United States. Uh, more on that later on. So what's the significance of this battle? Uh, the battle establishes Grant as the best Union uh, general, the best general that the Union has. Unfortunately for Lincoln, the Confederacy's best general is about to emerge in the Eastern Theater in Virginia, that being Robert E. Lee. And eventually Lincoln's going to realize that he's going to have to get Grant from the Western Theater to the Eastern Theater to take on uh, Lee, and that eventually will happen. Another thing to note about this battle is that it does show that the Anaconda Plan is not going to end up being limited just to cutting off the southern coastline. It's not just going to be limited to cutting off the Mississippi River and dividing the Confederacy. The Anaconda Plan eventually will also involve taking out railroads. And again, uh, these railroads right here were, were seriously destroyed by uh, Grant shortly after uh, the Battle of Shiloh. And eventually he's going to send uh, Sherman to go down through Georgia and then through South Carolina to cut up all the railroads there as well. So keep in mind that right now the, the Union strategy is mostly focused on cutting off water transportation and trade. It's going to later on focus more on cutting off uh, the railroads. Okay, now let's talk about the establishment of Robert E. Lee. So what ends up happening is that uh, George McClellan, pictured at the top, 
is going to be tasked with going after the capital of the Confederacy in Virginia, which, again, the capital is Richmond. And Robert E. Lee is going to be tasked with saving Richmond from being captured by the Union. And as you can see, he's going to be successful. Uh, this will lead to a Confederate victory. Uh, however, it's really because it's not so much because Lee wins this uh, series of battles. It's more because uh, McClellan loses uh, in the end. Okay, so if you look at the map here, you can see that McClellan is going to take troops and he is going to go and march them up this peninsula right here in the map on his way towards Richmond. Now keep in mind that McClellan's the type of general that is very cautious in battle. He's very slow to move. He doesn't like to fight unless he has a chance of an overwhelming victory that loses very little of his troops. Because again, he likes to be liked and the northern citizens are going to like him if he doesn't lose many of their soldiers. So he's the opposite of Grant in that sense and he gets opposite results because of it. So while Grant is losing a lot of men but winning battles, McClellan is going to end up uh, saving a lot of men but losing battles. And on, uh, in the end, honestly, he prolongs the war probably a lot longer than it should have been. So Robert E. Lee, a Virginian who did not believe in secession but believed in fighting for his home state, is going to launch a series of attacks on McClellan's troops and he's not going to win all of these. I believe he actually lost most of them, but I, I can't remember for sure. But he uh, he's definitely uh, doing this because he knows the kind of leader that McClellan is. He knows that he doesn't have to completely defeat McClellan. All he has to do is fight him enough to kind of get in McClellan's head and make McClellan think that the, the battles are going to lead to too many losses of life and then he can get McClellan to back down. So Lee is going to inflict damage on the Union Army. Uh, honestly, if McClellan had stuck to the plan and McClellan had not backed away, he probably would have defeated Lee, even though Lee was a very good general. Uh, Lee was also a very smart general, and he knew what tactics to use and what time to use them. So he knew in this case that he did not need to have an all-out victory on the battlefield, he just needed to inflict enough damage on the Union Army to where McClellan would not have the guts to keep fighting, the stomach to keep fighting. He did not want to lose uh, too many men. So McClellan at this point in the war, he should have been able to defeat Lee and take Richmond and maybe even end the war right then, but because Lee did enough damage, he basically freaked McClellan out or got in his head enough to where McClellan retreated without actually uh, accomplishing much of anything. So what is the significance of this? Oh, and here you see uh, Lee with his famous horse named Traveler, who he is buried next to. Richmond, uh, the significance is that Richmond is going to be saved. The Confederate capital is going to be saved, at least for now. Now, by the end of the war, once Grant gets to Virginia later on, uh, Richmond is going to fall and Richmond is going to be burned. More on that uh, in later lecture. Uh, this does also establish Lee as the best general in the Confederacy, and honestly, probably the best general in the entire war. Uh, he is able to do more with less. Oftentimes, he has fewer troops than the, uh, his Union opposition, but he's still able to pull off victories just like he did with McClellan. His right-hand man eventually is going to be Stonewall Jackson, by the way. So at this point, Lee is feeling very bold, very confident, and he decides, uh, I mean, one of the problems that Lee has, if you consider it a problem, is that he's so confident that he almost, uh, and, his, and his men, by the way, have utmost confidence in Lee as well, uh, they all are so confident that they feel like they can invade uh, the Union. And so they're going to invade through Maryland. Now, why would they invade the Union? Because that doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, because I told you before that there was not a need to, def to invade uh, the Union. There was not a need to go on the offensive in order to uh, conquer the Union. So Lee's going to invade the Union, but he's not doing it because he wants to conquer the Union. The reason that he's doing it is because he knows that if he does this, then number one, the northern citizens are going to start seeing the war literally in their backyards, and they're going to turn on Lincoln. 
Uh, so it's really a political move. He says, if I invade the Union and make the Union be on the doorsteps or in the backyards of Union citizens, and they see this war firsthand, then they will cease to, def uh, to support Lincoln. They will cease to support this war, and they will let the Confederacy secede. Uh, and he was right w about this. And had he been more successful in his invading of the North, this may have uh, worked. And another reason that he's wanting to do this is because he wants to earn British support. Remember, I told you that the British, uh, they were considering joining the Confederacy because they wanted to have access to southern cotton, and they were struggling to have access to southern cotton because of the war and because of the northern blockade of the southern coastline, because of the Anaconda Plan. But Lee knew that the British would not join unless uh, the British thought that the Confederacy actually had a chance. And this is kind of like what happened in the uh, Battle of Saratoga, if you remember that from the American Revolution. The French wanted to support uh, the United States in the American Revolution, but only if they thought that they, uh, only if they thought that the uh, United States had a decent chance of winning the war. So Lee's going to have to pr prove to the British that the Confederacy has a chance. And ultimately, he will fail to do that at the Battle of Antietam. So here is the most significant battle of this lecture. And in my opinion, it's the most significant battle of the war because it also leads to the Emancipation Proclamation and it leads to the British deciding not to help out. So the Battle of Antietam, which is sometimes called the Battle of Sharpsburg, uh, depending again on which side of the war you're asking about or, or asking, uh, is going to take place here in Maryland. So Union invades this border state. Remember, Maryland, even though it had slavery and even though it was a southern state, it was still part of the Union. So Lee does invade the Union here, uh, and he is going to be defeated in the end. But not defeated as badly as he could have been because he's going to be fighting against McClellan again, and McClellan's caution is going to allow Lee to escape. Okay, again, this is the most important battle of this lecture, in my opinion, because of its after effects. It's the most significant battle of the Civil War. Uh, there are some other major turning point battles like Gettysburg and Vicksburg, uh, which we'll talk about later on. Uh, but Antietam is definitely one of the major ones as well, if not the biggest. Okay, so the Battle of Antietam uh, is going to be the battle in which McClellan intercepts Lee and uses violence and force to stop the invasion. This is going to be a very bloody war. Uh, how does McClellan know that Lee is trying to invade the Union? Uh, the story that I've heard is that uh, Lee had the secret battle plans rolled up into some cigars, and some Union soldiers stumbled across these cigars and found the plans and then were able to tell McClellan. Uh, and so McClellan was able to intercept uh, Lee. So this battle is going to be very bloody. There's going to be part of this battle that takes place in a cornfield, and there are accounts that in this cornfield, by the end of the, of the uh, battle, that the cornfield had been shot down. It looked afterwards as if they had taken lawnmowers across the cornfield, and all the stalk, stalks of the corn have been shot uh, to like ankle height. Uh, so, again, this is going to be a very fierce battle. There's going to be another part of the battle where you see some Confederate soldiers that are going to uh, kind of lay down uh, in a ditch. And in the end, uh, this ditch is going to be so filled with uh, bodies that you could not cross it on foot without stepping upon several bodies. Uh, anyway, uh, so in the end, the battle is going to be, in a sense, a draw. Uh, by the end of the day, by the end of the fighting of that first and only day of the fighting, uh, you're going to see basically Lee on one side of Antietam Creek and uh, McClellan and his Union troops on the other side of Antietam Creek. And then Lee is going to be waiting the whole next day for McClellan to come attack and finish the job. And this had been a very bloody battle against the bloodiest single day of the war with over 22,000 casualties. Now, casualties doesn't necessarily mean dead. It can mean missing or wounded. 
And you do know that a lot of people that got wounded ended up dying later on because of poor uh, medical uh, technology at the time. But this will be the bloodiest battle of the war, and it will be heavily photographed. So Lee is going to be waiting for battle the next day, and it doesn't come because McClellan doesn't want to have another bloody day like this one. And Lincoln is going to be extremely frustrated with this. And he is going to be so frustrated that Lincoln himself, and you see him there, is going to visit the battlefield so that he can, in person, order McClellan to stop being cautious and to uh, attack Lee and not let Lee get away. And again, Lee's expecting an attack and it's not coming. So there you see Lincoln and McClellan speaking uh, in a tent at the battlefield. And uh, Lincoln is going to basically hear a bunch of excuses from McClellan. And in the end, he's going to order McClellan point blank, go attack. And so what happens is that Lee, in the meantime, is going to retreat. He is going to live to fight another day. And McClellan's going to take about a month to uh, cross the creek, which is not a very big creek. I've seen it in person. It's a creek that you could wade through in 30 seconds. It takes him about a month to get all of his troops across this little creek, again, because he's basically stalling. And because of this, Lee is going to be able to escape, and McClellan is going to be fired uh, for being too cautious. This is actually the second time that McClellan got fired. He got fired after the Peninsula Campaign uh, for being too cautious, but the American people in the North liked McClellan so much that they pressured Lincoln to rehire McClellan, and then here again McClellan fails because he's being too cautious. So even though McClellan pretty much wins the battle, he loses the war here uh, at this point because he allows Lee to escape and reassemble what's left of his army. I mean, McClellan had the worst of excuses that he gave to Lincoln. He'd tell him sometimes that the horses were too tired. And eventually Lincoln has had enough of McClellan, and McClellan is going to be fired uh, as a result. But Lincoln has another problem besides the fact that the northern citizens like McClellan, and he, he's just fired uh, the man that the northern citizens like. This war is going to be photographed and these photographs are going to start showing up in northern newspapers. If you look at this picture here, you can see that uh, that's that ditch that I was telling you about. It was known as the Sunken Road. And there you see the dead bodies of all the Confederates that had uh, been uh, shooting their rifles from that uh, sunken road. So whenever these kinds of pictures start showing up, remember this is the first war ever in which... Uh, the uh, people could see photographs as they came in. Um, not live, but almost live. Like within a few days of the battle, they would see uh, these, these pictures show up. And when that happens, Northerners don't have the stomach for it, and they don't like this war, and their support for the war is going to drop. And uh, so Lincoln's going to have to find a way to boost Northern morale and get their support. Otherwise, uh, he's going to get voted out of office, and the Confederacy may end up winning this war. So what's the significance of this battle? Well, one piece of significance is that it does hurt the Confederacy because it makes the Confederacy look weak. It looks like uh, they can't win this war, and so uh, Britain is going to start reconsidering supporting uh, the Confederacy. They're going to start, as the notes say, withdrawing their support from the Confederacy, but there's going to be another reason, uh, a final nail in the coffin for their support that I'll get to in a moment. Remember that at this point, the purpose, the sole purpose of the war is to preserve the Union. And that is what Lincoln has been saying all along, but at this point, the Northern morale is so low that preserving the Union is no longer a good enough reason. So Lincoln's going to have to come up with another reason to boost Northern support for the war, and he's about to add a moral cause to the war. And as you can see from the notes, the arrows are about to point you to a bolded box, a very important uh, box, and that's going to be related to the Emancipation Proclamation. So the, the Battle of Antietam is going to lead to a new cause being added to the war, and that, again, will be the Emancipation Proclamation. So let's talk about it. 
Uh, and he had already been drafting the Emancipation Proclamation earlier in the war, but this, it's like he had had an ace up his sleeve and he was saving this ace up his sleeve till the right moment, and now was the moment. Because if he did not do this now, the Northern support would be so low that he would be under immense pressure to end the war and let the Confederacy go and keep slavery. So to boost Northern morale, Lincoln will issue the Emancipation Proclamation. And what it specifically did is it announced that slavery was no longer allowed in any of the rebelling states. Now, that's very interesting to note because remember that the rebelling states did not recognize him as their presidency or as their president, so they did not recognize his authority, and so they pretty much said we are going to ignore the Emancipation Proclamation. And on top of that, Lincoln still wanted to keep the border states. He didn't want them to secede, so he allowed them to keep slavery. So the day that the Emancipation Proclamation took effect, you didn't actually see any slaves getting freed. However, as the war carries on and as the northern uh, army invades further into the south, they are going to be able to start freeing slaves on plantations. And it's a very uh, beautiful thing to think about the Union Army coming into one of these southern plantations and then rolling out a copy of the Emancipation Proclamation, reading it to the slaves and telling them that they were, for the first time in their lives, free. So, what's the significance of the Emancipation Proclamation? Well, now there's a second mission to this war. The Union does not need to win this war just to preserve the Union, but it also now needs it to win in order to end slavery. Remember that if they don't win this war, then the South's going to continue to ignore the Emancipation Proclamation. Another thing that makes this significant is that it's going to uh, lay some groundwork. What this does is it's going to lay groundwork for the ending of slavery everywhere at the end of the war. And that is going to be known as the 13th Amendment. So what happens is that Lincoln basically, he's going to support the Emancipation Proclamation. He's going to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. Of course, he's going to support it. And then he's going to ultimately... He will get reelected in 1864, and whenever he gets reelected after issuing the Emancipation Proclamation, he's going to get even bolder and start pushing for the passage of the 13th Amendment, which will ultimately end slavery across the United States after the war is concluded, even in border states. So you can see that this Emancipation Proclamation has an enormous impact because if you look at the notes, I have more to say about its impact. Uh, It's going to have an impact on uh, foreign policy, especially with Britain. It's also going to have an impact in both the North and the South. And it will gain him the support he needs for the time being from Northern citizens while simultaneously robbing the, uh, the Confederacy of British support. So in the end... This is going to be the final nail in the coffin for any chance of Britain supporting the Confederacy. Remember that Britain at this point had already abolished slavery. They were not willing to support a country that was trying to fight in order to preserve slavery. The only reason they were willing to support the Confederacy before this was because they wanted Southern cotton and the war was about preserving the Union. It was about Southern independence. Uh, Now the war is also about slavery, and because this war includes abolition of slavery, uh, Britain cannot fight against abolition of slavery. Because the Union's purpose is now about getting rid of slavery, Britain cannot, on moral grounds, support the Confederacy. And besides, cotton was very difficult to get because of the Anaconda Plan, and so they start looking to other Sources. If you look at this cartoon here, you can see Uncle Sam's fighting the Confederacy. And here you see John Bull representing Britain. And Britain says, you know what, this isn't even worth the trouble getting cotton from the South. We're going to go to India or we're going to go to Egypt and they're going to start getting their cotton there instead. So again, since the war is also about ending slavery at this point, it's always about preserving the Union, and that's always Mission A. But now Mission B is also to get rid of slavery. Because of that, Britain would not join the Confederacy, and that is going to severely hurt the chances of the Confederacy uh, in terms of winning this war. 
it's not going to be a 100% uh, loss for the Confederacy. Uh, the, the Confederacy does still have a chance, but this severely hurts their chances. They, their only chance at winning now is basically to drag the war out long enough to where the morale boost that the North gets from the Emancipation Proclamation, they need to just drag the war out long enough to where uh, the, the Northern morale sinks again and they start to turn their backs on Lincoln again. That's going to be their strategy pretty much from here on out. And it almost does work. In the end, it doesn't. Okay, so the impact within the United States in the northern states is that, again, for a time, not for the longest of times, but for a time, the northern support for the war is going to go up because now, besides just preserving the Union, they have a moral cause. And that moral cause is to end the enslavement of almost 4 million people in the southern states. And this makes, again, Lincoln a moral leader that can get support uh, from the Northerners. And another thing that this does is that a lot of the male slaves, once they do get emancipated, a lot of them start to join the Union Army and actually fight against the Confederacy themselves. And when they do this, you know that they're going to be fighting very hard because they're fighting literally for their freedom and for family members' freedom. So they will fight very well. And so basically, every time that the uh, Confederacy loses a male slave, they are potentially now also having to fight against an additional Union soldier. More on that a little bit later on. The impact on the South is going to be pretty devastating as time goes on. There, that, That's a picture uh, here. If you look right here, I told you about the idea of soldiers coming in and freeing slaves and then telling them that they are free. That's what's going on right here in the picture. So the domestic impact initially is that no Confederates are going to listen to this because they did not recognize uh, Lincoln's authority, so no slaves are going to be freed. But again, like I said, over time, as the Union troops... Uh, invade further and further into the Confederacy, they are going to start to free slaves. Also, there are when rumors of the Emancipation Proclamation start to reach plantations, it's going to embolden a lot of slaves to run away, especially if there are rumors that there are Union troops nearby, and then they can run to the Union troops for safety. And possibly join the Union Army. On top of that, this is going to be another blow to the Confederate economy. Remember that the Confederate economy was already struggling uh, because of the Anaconda Plan. They were cut off from foreign trade. They could not sell their cotton to Britain. Uh, they were having, uh, later on you'll see the Mississippi River gets cut off. They're starting to lose their railroads, and they're going to lose their railroads even more. But remember that the Southern economy was ultimately, its backbone was slavery. And if it's losing its slaves, it's losing its source of labor, it's losing the backbone, the foundation of its economy. And so as their economy crumbles, their way of life crumbles, uh, their willingness to fight will also slowly crumble. So this will ultimately hurt Confederate morale. Uh, and on top of that, they could no longer count on British help. So they've lost their only or their ma only major potential ally because the war is now also about ending slavery, and they're also losing the backbone of their economy uh, with the loss of slaves. And again, a lot of these male slaves are going on to join the Union Army. So the army that they're fighting is actually growing. So again, this is, I would say, in a lot of ways, the beginning of the end for the Confederacy although they will still fight and fight very well for a while. Uh, it's going to take some more battles, some more turning points before they're really on the road to defeat. But even then, they almost dragged the war out long enough to where the North wants to give up. Okay, so let's talk uh, about another theme. I'll talk more about these freedmen, these freed slaves in a moment. You can see that there's an arrow going from the box that we're leaving onto another box. We'll get back to the issue of these freed uh, slaves in a moment. But let's talk about women first. So what's going to be the role of women during this war? Well, the role of women is that they are going to, while the men are fighting, and this happens 
on both sides. They are going to maintain any businesses, maintain any farms, maintain plantations. Uh, in the north are going to maintain especially the factories while the men fight as soldiers and that's very important remember that if the factories aren't producing say in the union the factories aren't producing weapons for the soldiers then the soldiers will have nothing to fight with and they'll lose so women don't play a secondary role in this war they play a vital role if they don't maintain the economy of uh, their side if they don't provide through factory work if they don't provide weapons uh, for the soldiers, then the soldiers aren't going to be able to fight, and their countries aren't going to be able to sustain, sustain themselves. Some women are more actively involved in the fighting themselves. Many of them serve as nurses on the battlefields, and some of the time, uh, these these uh, they would have these makeshift hospitals right next to the battlefields. In fact, there was... Uh, a story once of a woman who was serving as a nurse, kind of like you see in the picture there, and she was tending to one of the injured soldiers, and as she's tending to the soldier, a bullet from the battlefield comes through the wall of the tent and hits the soldier, killing him as he's being uh, helped. So uh, these nurses sometimes served very close to the battlefield. One particular nurse is going to be Clara Barton, and she is very noteworthy uh, because eventually she will found the American Red Cross, and as many of you already know, the Red Cross does a lot of work to help out people. They do blood drives very often, uh, oftentimes at schools. Your school might have done a, uh, a blood drive, and you may have donated to the Red Cross some of your blood to help people uh, survive uh, surgeries and injuries in hospitals even today. So Clara Barton is going to be the most famous of the nurses. Uh, she will be at the Battle of Antietam. And if I remember correctly, she might have been that nurse that was tending to that soldier uh, that got shot by the stray bullet. Okay, let's wrap up this lecture by talking about the role of blacks during this war. So over or about, I think it was 180,000, but it was a around 200,000, up to around 200,000 blacks are going to serve in the military. Many of them are going to be ex-slaves, and you know that they are going to fight hard because, again, they are fighting for their freedom. That being said, they weren't treated totally equally. They did serve under white generals, uh, and the reason they served under white generals uh, would be partially probably due to discrimination, but also probably because they had never been to a military school and therefore were no, uh, they were not qualified to be a general. Uh, but they could still get some training enough to serve as troops. Now, there was definite discrimination in the fact that they were often segregated in their, uh, whenever they fought. So there was still discrimination. There was a a belief among a lot of Union generals that they were not capable as, as, of fighting as well as white soldiers. And sometimes that might have been a reasonable claim because they might not have had as much training because they had just been freed from slavery. But a lot of that had to do with the fact that there was racist uh, ideology even in the North. And they weren't seen as being capable of being trained uh, to fight as well as whites. And so oftentimes they would find themselves... Uh, being given less significant uh, jobs, less significant battles to fight in, uh, because there was not a trust of their competence. However, they did fight, and they did fight with distinction. The most famous of these is going to be uh, the 54th Massachusetts, and there you see the 54th Massachusetts in action uh, in a, a battle at Fort Wagner, I believe that's in South Carolina. I don't talk about that battle, but I do want you to know that, generally speaking, black regiments like the 54th Massachusetts are going to fight very well, very bravely, very successfully, and in a sense, that's going to help them earn respect from whites that they did not already have. One thing to note, and this I'll talk about later on, is that it was very bad for these soldiers if they lost and were captured by Confederate forces because the Confederate forces did not view them as people. They viewed them as property, and oftentimes rather than hold them as prisoners of war, they would just massacre them. And I'll talk more about one of those cases uh, in a later lecture. Okay, so this wraps up the introductory lecture on the battles of the Civil War. In the next lecture, I'm going to get into some more of the turning point battles, uh, especially uh, Vicksburg and Gettysburg, which happened at virtually the same time in 1863. So we'll get to the biggest battle of the Civil War 
Gettysburg uh, in uh, the next lecture. So in the next lecture, basically, we're going to continue talking about uh, the fighting.